here we go. Okay, and I'm gonna officially um, kick us off. Um, Barbara Zia is the president of the DC League of Women Voters, and I'm gonna turn the microphone over to her and, um, and, our, and then uh, to introduce Tova uh, and introduce us all and say hello and welcome us. Did I tell you what your job was, Barbara? <laughs> yes, you did. You always tell me what to do, Myra, and I appreciate it. I'm sorry. It's a great honor to welcome Tova Wang. She comes to us from Harvard's Ash Center for Democratic Governance, where she's a senior researcher in democratic process. Before that, she was director of policy and research at the Center for Secure and Modern Elections, where she worked on voter registration reform and oversaw and conducted research on how to develop transformative strategies for increasing political participation among marginalized groups. She's been working on improving democracy since the 2000 presidential election, including several years as senior democracy fellow at Demos. She's an expert on democratic practices in the United States focusing on issues related to greater political inclusion in the U.S. and has completed major studies on increasing voter participation rates among low-income people, communities of color, naturalized immigrants, youth, and Native Americans. Her book, The Politics of Voter Suppression, Defending and Expanding Americans' Right to Vote, is critically acclaimed. Her case study on jail-based voting in DC was released in January. The DC League is grateful for Toba's leadership and work on behalf of all marginalized voters, among whom we count ourselves until we achieve statehood for the District of Columbia. Thank you. Yay, Toba. And I'm um, gonna put the links to to two of um, the most recent case studies. And just to let you know that this meeting is um, to have this conversation with Tova is our purpose. And so pl uh, please take as much time as you need and then um, we'll have Q&A and conversation. And if we have enough time towards the end, I do have a, a voting video that was created by Pam Bailey um, from More Than Our Crimes, and it's all about DC. And it's about, I think, not uh, 13 minutes. So um, we'll have as much of the video as you guys have um, have appetite for. But um, I'm turning the microphone over to Tova and gonna share um, the, her, um, the links to her publications. So I'm going to stop. I can't click and talk at the same time. So I'm going to stop. <laughs> stop talking. I can't talk. So <laughs> hi everybody. It's really great to meet you all. Um, I I have been and am more than ever a fan of the League of Women Voters in D.C. Having done this um, project, I am. Um, I have done a lot of work in the past on returning citizens and restoration of voting rights for people who have felony convictions. And in meetings with people who work on that issue, it really emerged that um, there was a tremendous amount of interest in the issue of people who are in jail being held pretrial and for dis misdemeanors um, and their voting access and their voting rights. It's a population of people who, as you guys know, haven't lost the right to vote at all in the first place, but are rarely given the opportunity and practice to be able to vote. And I I, I had kind of heard about Chicago doing something like this. I knew that they had some kind of polling place in the Cook County jail at some point, but I didn't really know a lot about it. There was a, a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of, you know, asking of me to do more research on this. And I vaguely knew about DC. And if anyone had more experience at this uh, stage of the story, I'd, you know, that would be great to talk about. But the ANC election um, of somebody inside the jail, I think was a real milestone. And so I kind of knew that, um, but I didn't know much more. And as I looked at it more, it became really clear to me that DC was not only doing this thing, it was a model for the country really um, in all sorts of ways. And then as I Kind of dug into it even more, I realized that 
you know, despite the title, I wouldn't really end up writing an academic report or even something that was more of like a guide. Um, I was going to end up telling a story because, um, you know, it's the people who engaged in this effort for, we have Charles Sullivan, I think, with us who, you know, as uh, Myra was saying, had started this Oh, really 50 years ago and in DC, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, at least 30. Um, and so, and then has has really gone through the years and they're just some spectacular people and organizations that have made this happen and are making it um, so that it's implemented really well. And the league is of course also central to that and a big part of the story. Um, just by way of background, I will, so people in pretrial and most people for misdemeanors are not, do not lose their right to vote. And there are about half a million people who are in um, jail for pretrial. Um, and almost all of them are not there for a felony for which they would not be able to vote. 427,000 of them have not been convicted. Um, and we know because of the nature of the criminal justice system that these people are gonna be disproportionately people of color and then people who can't afford bail. Um, and so, um, so that's obviously problematic that they don't have access to to their voting rights and um we also have a bunch of research showing that people who have been in jail even in this situation are less likely to vote after that experience and so it, you know making it kind of more troubling um and as i looked at it further it was clear that having some kind of in person voting at the jail like they had been doing also in cook county was really the gold standard that people that other the states localities should really be striving for for a couple of reasons um first of all the enormous barriers to voting otherwise so voter registration especially if you don't have same day registration like we have in dc um is a whole nother process right and you can miss the deadlines people who are in jail cannot register online they can't use online voter registration they're not allowed onto the internet they don't get the forms there's a lot of misinformation, of course, both with respect to eligibility to register and to vote. So they don't know. There's no information. Nobody knows. Them, right. Um, and and it does. It's certainly, you know, not always a priority in the jails unless you have the League of Women Voters going into the jails and registering everybody. But that's not true everywhere. Um, and then if you can only vote by mail, you've got to somehow receive the mail ballot. Um, you can't use same day registration if you vote by mail. Um, and this is a pretty transient population. Um, in some states, not in DC, you have to apply for an absentee ballot still, and it's not no excuse. And there are actually states, and I'm gonna put in a plug for it. I, you might have put it in the chat, Myra, I don't know, but um, there are a lot of, there are a bunch of states where um, being in jail is not an excuse for having to vote absentee. So I thought that was kind of an interesting little discovery in all this. Um, and, you know, it's also, so the, there's the male part of it, but there's also, it's a very isolated experience. Um, and you're it's sort of dependent on requesting it or having someone bring it to you and, you know, kind of figuring it out and, you know, with very little information available. So I, I was pretty convinced that, um, for those reasons alone, having an actual in-person option in jail was really important. And then the other part of it was, it was my intuition as well as a lot of people that being able to vote in jail in person would have a bigger impact on people's propensity to vote while in jail, but then also after getting out. And I think um, we're starting to see that that is actually true, at least in terms of the turnout um, while people are in jail. Um, and um, you know, I heard that I've heard that from outside DC, but I also I certainly heard it from Charles Thornton, um, who told me that you know having it be in person just takes it to the next level. That people um, being able to cast their ballot in the same way that everybody else in DC is doing so was really meaningful for people and made people feel like real human beings, real citizens, real part of our community. Um, and I, you know, one of the things that really struck me in the process of this um, report was the um, ways in which the jails, uh, jail staff, who I think a lot of you know, have um, responded to this. And one of the things that um, Mr. Gaskins, who you may know from the jail work, said to me, it said he said, it may sound trivial, but what was very important to those residents that I saw vote 
was that they wanted that I voted sticker. And one of the reasons I heard was they wanted to send it home to their family to let them know they are being included, that they are taking a step to being part of the community, making decisions for the community. That's one of the things that really impacted me on these election days. And just hearing that story actually really moved me as well, um, because that's really making democracy and voting and elections a community experience. Um, and I I will say, I we also put out, I don't know my right if you put this in the tab, we just put out um, a 50 state guide on, okay, yeah, about, um, what the laws are in place in all the states that either hinder or facilitate the ability to have this kind of in-person jail voting. And like I said, there are a few, you know, real winners that don't even allow for jail to be an excuse for requesting an absentee ballot. So then, okay, so then just going into the story um, of what happened in DC, which, you know, as I said earlier, the people who were there are on the line, but, um, it does go back, like I said, 30 years um, at least with um, Charles Sullivan, as well as Charles Thornton. Um, there are three Charleses in this story, if not more, that I discovered. <laughs> but um, it really did it start with Charles Sullivan and, and Charles um, Thornton doing this work, registering people in the jail 20, 30 years ago. I talked to Charles Thornton quite a bit, um, and he was telling me about how the Obama election was a real turning point in the work that people were doing in terms of registering people and providing ballots in the jail, that there was really so much excitement around the Obama election that it was kind of a, a pivot point for um, groups to, to sort of put out there how much people who are in jail want to vote. And it is not disinterest that given the opportunity, there's are people who want to, to vote. And there was a really big upsurge. And there was, I think, that really um, activated the... Um, effort to get an actual jail-based voting location. Um, and I know that a lot of people did try to do it during the Obama years, but it didn't happen. Um, but then, and, and during all this time, obviously in these decades up to 22, the league was the driving force really of doing the work in the jails in terms of you know making it this well-oiled machine as Charles, I think, put it, of registering people to vote, educating them, getting people ballots um, throughout this entire time. I know from the interviews that I had with, you know, your colleagues that really the effort was there to go to every cell and just, you know, again and again and again. Um, and, uh, and just, you know, it, no matter what the person had done, no matter who the person was, that they, they would really try to get them to register and to vote and give them information. I know that also the league was very involved in another big problem that happens, which is when people fill out these forms incorrectly, and sometimes the registration or the ballot can get rejected. Rejected, And I know that the league also worked with the DOC staff to make sure that people were able to correct those mistakes and have their registration or their ballot counted, which is um, sort of something that flies under the radar, but is actually really important. Um, and so, over these years, the momentum built. And then finally in 2022, um, the uh, Election Modernization Act, I guess that was that was in 2020, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but it was the Election Modernization Act that required jails to be vote centers. And then a couple of years later, as we know, um, DC again led the way in um, making sure that people never lose the right to vote, including people who have been incarcerated in prison. So um, so these laws were passed, big shout out to the third Charles, Charles Allen, <laughs> who's been a champion of election reform um, in DC, as well as Robert White, who's been very, very uh, much a champion of um, rights for uh, justice impacted people in general. And I, I wanna just flag also that this was made a law because that is not the case necessarily in some of the other places that are trying to do this. It's being done kind of as an informal, I suppose, arrangement or relatively informal arrangement between the corrections people and um, the Board of Elections with obviously tremendous urging of people from the outside. And it, I talked to Charles Allen quite a bit about the importance of it being a law because it allows for them to be held accountable, the people who are supposed to be implementing it to be held accountable. And um, it allows for a level of enforceability the city council has hearings to make sure that it's being implemented properly. And then something I have not thought about, even though, I, as I had said before we started the um, 
I am nominally a lawyer, um, that putting it in the law meant that you could have a private right of action so people could sue for non-enforcement or non-compliance with this law. So that I thought was a really important note. Um, but as I started out saying, it's really the people that were involved in this effort, both leading up to the law being passed and now implementing it that has been so striking. Um, and is the reason why it has worked so well in DC, um, that has happened at all in DC, and, and that um, DC has really become, as I said, this model for the country. And I'm out there, and, and Myra is too, like, you know, waving the DC flag as being really um, at the forefront of this because people, people uh, seem to somehow forget about DC's accomplishments, which are many in this area. Um, and so, um, so one of the notable things, as I kind of refer to, is the jail staff. Now, I know that it was not 100% smooth, um, you know, from beginning to end. But in general, and certainly at this point, the jail staff, I was just really taken by. Um, I think they really see this as part of the reentry process and understand it to be part of what will lead people to become good citizens um, when they get out of jail. And so uh, them really being on board in a, a pretty authentic way, I think is critical and is, is you know, maybe fairly unusual, but is gonna be critical to make this happen in other places well. Um, and so them having the attitude of that, this is that their mission is reentry, and um, that this is part of that is really important. Um, and so, um, the other thing is, of course, the Board of Elections. And um, as I say, I, you know, the Board of Elections in D.C., unsung, not, I mean, heroes is strong, but they do such a great job. And I feel like always the rest of the country, I mean, like everything else, there are mistakes made. But in general, D.C. has the most progressive election laws in the country. And I think that that is very little known in general. Um, but in, a, I think, a first um, uh, the Board of Elections has somebody whose entire job is the implementation of the jail and prison voting, which is really extraordinary. And um, there are two other people in that office who also work on this. So that's that's pretty amazing. And what's also incredibly interesting, it's Scott Sussman, who I've become you know good friends with. He's a really great guy. Um, prior to this job, he spent 26 years with the Bureau of Prisons and for a short time prior to being at the Board of Elections was actually pr the person at the Bureau of Prisons who had to answer the calls of the Board of Elections about the voting um, in, in the prison. Um, so he really, it, it was really important that he had this background. He had a lot of built-in trust with the people, with the jail staff, and he understood how um, they work, yes, also Lene. <laughs> there are a bunch of people to shout out. Um, but his experience has been really, really helpful in facilitating trust and facilitating conversation and building those relationships. He can say, I know, I know what it is that you're talking about. And I have also heard from everyone that he's very communicative, you know, responsive in general, and all those kinds of good things. Um, I would also shout out Arlen Badu at um the DC Board of Elections. It's just a sweetheart of a guy, first of all, but it's just so good at his job and that being so important to this um, and being very experienced. And then, of course, the organizers, um, you know, primarily the League, um, along, along with the Trollses <laughs> um, that have been doing this for so many years. And um, as I mentioned before, it was really the consistency of just showing up over the years and having a trusted relationship going into this whole new enterprise that was incredibly important. And um, and I know from talking to them that the people at the jail feel tremendously grateful for the support that they get from the league and other organizers who help make this happen. Um, and and so that's, that's just like, that's the headliner of this whole thing. Um, the collaboration that's been taking place among all of these individuals and these groups, which is not not usual um, all over the country. Um, and so now that it's in place, the law is in place, um, we heard some from the people who actually implement it about how it works. There, there are kind of a lot of logistical moving pieces, but from what I understand, it's not hugely difficult to do, which has been a really important thing to take away from DC to share with other people, 
that it's not all that expensive. It's not a huge amount of work, you know, all these kinds of things that people at least, you know, say that they're concerned about. Um, they, um, so they had three days of voting. There are apparently three floors at the jail. And so they were able to bring one floor down a day. Um, and I know that um, they, I think, and I hope they're still, you know, kind of really doing this of making a big deal of letting people know ahead of time that that voting is going to be taking place and they need to be dressed and ready to go on the day that they um, have been assigned to, to be able to vote at the jail. Um, and then they vote in person um, using the same kind of voting technology that all of us uh, use when we go to vote, if we vote in person. Um, that during three days, this started in 2022, and um, and each group was sort of escorted to the polling place um, by jail staff. One of the really cool things also, and this is totally unique to DC, is that the poll workers um, are people who are jail in the jail themselves, and which is a whole other topic of conversation, which is really amazing. It's not being done anyplace else. When I tell people in other places that DC does that, they fall off their chairs and say, what an amazing idea. Um, and so trying to spread that around too. But so they would go through the process of um, uh, seeing if they were registered, if they were not registered, if they were eligible, they could use same day registration. Um, and the people would use the touch, have, are using the touch screen ballot marking devices like everybody else. Um, or using um, a paper ballot. And again, the same same as everybody else. Um, and the turnout has been excellent. Um, I will tell you more about also, we have actually more data out of um, Denver, which has started doing this, and as well as Chicago, which I'll get back to. But we do know that in 22, in the June primary, um, two, 218 people voted at the jails in the primary in 22. And 132 of those were cast in person at the polling place and 86 were um, on paper. Um, but I will get to the Chicago and Denver data in a minute. Um, so DC really, as I have been saying, is it's got amazingly progressive policies on voting in general. It's been at the front of the pack when it comes to a lot of election um, procedures. And this is this is really just another example of that but it was decades of work by organizers, starting with organizers, bringing you know everybody else along, setting the foundation for this to happen. Um, and I've been telling this to people in other places. You know, it took years of showing up in the jails, doing the voter registration, doing the voter education before getting to that place. You know, it was kind of like a ladder of being a, able to get an actual polling place in the jail. So even in places where there are more conservative governments and so on, start there because you you work your way up to a level of trust um, and relationship that just you know organically happens to get to a place where that becomes possible. Um, and so it was this long-term groundwork that was laid after decades. Um, and then you know like I said, the other big takeaway here is the relationships and the trust building that went on and the coordination that continues to happen um, uh, now in order to make this successful. Um, and that is really what I, I share with people around the country. And it, you know, the, it continues to improve. I know that people are talking. I, I know that there was um, jail-based voting in the primary uh, that just happened, for which there was low turnout everywhere, I guess. Um, but they are gearing up definitely for um, the fall in 2024 election, presidential election, and everything else that's going to be on the ballot. Um, that they are going to try and do it uh, bigger and better um, uh, in 24. And I want to reiterate again the um, the impact that we saw it have on people who ha went through that voting experience. We were we have talked to people who were there, including people from the league um, and people from the jail and, pe and people from the board. And um, there really is anecdotal e evidence that having that in-person experience where you show up to vote um, and you're given information and education on, on what's on the ballot um, and what the voting process is, and you're there as part of a community with officials, government representatives in the room facilitating your participation had a really big impact on people. And I mean, in my dream of dreams, um, future research 
would be able to look at whether this has an impact on their propensity to vote after they are out, um, which is possible, but it would be a lot of work and um, would require some funding. So we'll see if that happens, but um, I'm certainly trying to convince people that that is something worth looking at. And I will just close by giving you some of the, um, the data out of Chicago and Denver. Um, where we just have more data, though I know that there's gonna be some more information coming out of DC also, because it really demonstrates the difference between having mail voting available and then having the in-person. So in Cook County, less than 7% of people in jail voted by mail in the 2018 primary. After having the jail-based voting location in 2020, about 33% of people held in the jails voted during the 2020 primary. By the November 2020 presidential election, in-person voting combined with same-day registration resulted in 37% of the jailed population voting from the four polling stations across the, the jails. Um, and for the June 22 presidential primary, um, when they expanded to five polling locations, um, people who are incarcerated voted at a higher rate than the voters in the city as a whole, 25% compared to 20%. Um, in Denver, they are doing this slightly differently, and, and I will give you a preview that, that we did a case study on Denver as well, um, and that will be coming out really soon, but um, the voter turnout in the jail in 2023 in their April municipal election, in the jails it was 79.4%, and in the, the city in general, it was 38.77%. Um, and in the June runoff, um, the turnout rate in the jails was 58.7% and compared to the overall turnout in the general population of 36.79%. And they had similar success in the November uh, election that they just had um, this past year of 36.5% um, from the jails um, casting a ballot. The other exciting news about Denver, and I will say that I think some of the practices and policies happening in DC directly fed into this. Colorado just a couple of weeks ago passed a bill requiring every county jail to have a vote center, um, an in-person voting process. It is the first of its kind. Um, they're doing amazing work in Denver, which I hope to tell that story too, but that that law now puts them, brings them along into the place where um, really DC has been already. and. Um, I know that, you know, sort of this story and and how this is being done in D.C. is getting out there, which was always my hope um, to demonstrate some ways in which it could be done successfully. And um, and so the league and Charlie Sullivan and Charles Thornton and the people at the board and and the corrections I mean, really have a lot to, to be proud of and certainly to improve upon. But it really is um, a remarkable, groundbreaking um uh, coming about of, of real really important voting rights work. So um, I guess I'll leave it at that and we can have more of a conversation or questions or whatever people want. Tova, I have a quick question. The, no, the turnout numbers that you're quoting for Chicago and Denver, are they of, from the pretrial population? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's the only group. That's, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, that they that can vote from the jails. I will say that you know, so just to the side, I guess, you know, so now DC is allowing everyone to vote, right? People who have been convicted of felonies and are serving time in prison, um, and it's like <laughs> nobody knows, and people talk about Maine and Vermont, <laughs> which they don't really do. I mean, it's so interesting. From what I understand, I have not been there, but the facilitation of it is so much better in DC. Um, and so that's been the other thing that I've been trying to spread the word about is that, you know, it's really DC that's doing this thing. Um, so anyway. I have another question. If, um... Did, were you able to dig into how how they educate voters in um, in Denver and in Chicago? Because I think mm -hmm. that's 
the opportunity for some real um, breakthrough and, and leveraging, um, uh, you know, peer instructors in a yep. carceral environment. And we have not been able to accomplish that, but I think that's an opportunity to kind of get some traction. Yeah, I mean, so it's been a huge issue in Denver too. Um, there's an organization, so the League of Course is involved there as they are with everywhere. I got, I have to tell you seriously on this issue. I, I did had no idea that the League is involved in this issue all over the country, um, and was really happy to learn that um, beyond the cities that I've just mentioned, actually. Um, but the voter education piece is problematic. Um, I think you know they rely on you guys and organizations. The other, the big organization, honestly, in Denver is um, CCJRC. And I'll, I'll have more about this, you know, soon. But um, one of the things that's kind of cool is that um, in this new law that just passed, there are certain requirements around voter education and the kinds of um, voting materials, educational materials that have to be allowed into the jail including information about the candidates, which is always um, tough to navigate. Um, and so, but that is, I mean, I think that is that is the key, that is the gap at this point still, you know, um, people not for all, well, not knowing they can vote, thinking that they can't vote, and then knowing how to vote and knowing what those opportunities are and so on and so on. And then even no, what's up for election and especially in the case of dc like what the hell are these positions <laughs> we have, we elect a lot of things uh a lot of different uh positions in dc um and all these kinds of things and i i heard from you and and from um scott that you know one of the big things was that people were very upset that they had to be registered with a party in order to vote in the primaries and had not realized that and um, that next time they would give people a lot of heads up about that because people got very excited about being able to vote to learn that they were not registered with a party and could not, so. Hey, Fran. Unmute yourself. Thank you for reminding me. Um, and I can take this down. So this is so inspiring and so helpful I had one brief comment relating to the the last lot of um, questions and then maybe a question that would be interesting to others if if not maybe it's something that could take offline because it's too niche um the the comment is that the issues about people not knowing um how things work, what they need to do, whether they're eligible or not, how to be eligible. That that is hardly unique. Yeah. To the jail population. I mean that, that's a feature, not a bug, in at least mm -hmm. American electoral politics. Uh -huh, and so that. taking fact into a question, um what is different um about the jail population? Is it that there's the same problems, but it's much worse? Are there perhaps opportunities because you've literally got a captive audience for yeah. voter education? There's a yeah. will. Um, you know, what are the way um ways it's 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 different? So that's my my first question, which I think would be perhaps to main for other people. My um more niche question is what kind of research um, would you want to see to help move this process along? I'm I'm just curious about, you know, where do you see the gaps, the possibilities, um, and, and not necessarily only academic research or yeah. legal research, but, yeah. you know, what are the stories that need to be told and to whom, and how might scholars or journalists or other people, filmmakers, be a part of that? Yeah, I mean, um, that's why I felt like it was important to do case studies um, mm -hmm. 
to tell to make it more individual that way. Although Denver did not turn out to be as much of a human story as as what happened here. Um, I think that, you know, yes, you have a lower income, you know, you have all the socioeconomic demographics of the population, but, you know, for people who are, and Myra should really answer this too. I mean, people in jail are very shut off. I mean, you know, they can't go online. Um, I think the television and radio opportunities options are very limited. Um, and so it's hardly a, a surprise that they don't know. And as you alluded to, I mean, God knows there's been a climate of fear intentionally created or for people who have, you know, are involved in one way or another with the criminal justice system around voting that is incredibly upsetting, right? Um, and misinformation and intimidation tactics being weaponized, you know, this whole issue being weaponized. And so, you know, now not only do you have people not knowing, you have people getting wrong information and then people being, you know, afraid even if they do think they're eligible to participate. So, I mean, that's that's something to combat. Um, I think, I mean, I think always with these things, and this goes for the restoration of voting rights too, and I guess there's some overlap, is um, it's always comes down to the people. And I know that in the states where restoration of voting rights for people who have felony convictions have, um, where the laws have been passed successfully recently, it was about people who were returning citizens themselves going in front, being at the front of this whole thing, going in front of the legislators, going in front of the public and telling their stories and not just being a number, like this number of people are disenfranchised, but here are the people who are disenfranchised. And it's not, you know, first of all, it's not like, don't get away from the stereotypes, right? And all of that, but also just how how people are in these positions. I mean, for the, so for future research, I mean, I would, there are other cities that are emerging to do this. Um, for example, I think Dallas. And one thing that I am really cognizant of is that Denver and DC are very progressive. And so it's less of a shock that the board of elections and the, the the jail staff and so on were and and the you know city government though this was not always true right um, but that the city council finally came around to wanting to do this um, that's not going to happen everywhere so quickly and so I'm not one of the things that I would like to get clearer on is I know that building up to the place where you can have this conversation you know laying those foundations is is the right way to go but. I'm not sure that we know as well how to navigate this in places where there's going to be more hostility to, to all of it. You know what I mean? Um, um, but I know, like, I mean, in Nashville, I know they're doing great work there and like, you know, my lights flashing, um, all, all kinds of places Austin, like that. So, Texas is having yeah. a good story. I, yep. I'll just say, having conducted these classes in the jail, that, that, um, that, basic civics instruction, understanding government, understanding who, what are the positions that we vote for, even in, in a jurisdiction as simple as the district. So we're sort of like a state, but we're not a state. And we vote for different kinds of offices. And um, the, the folks who are in the jail don't under, necessarily understand that. And Grace, that's why I was hoping somebody from Free Minds would come because it is a conversation. It is not a go in and have a class and have people magically know what's that's gonna right. show up on their ballot. So that's challenge number one. The classes are, are by design small. The population at the jail right now is close to 1,900 people. We're not going to make it through 1,900 class, you know, people in class in a year when we're having classes once or twice a month. So that so a different delivery method, which is the um, is the tablets that um, that every resident of the DC jail has, but we have not been able to transfer our designed for tablet material to actually get onto the tablet. So that has been a challenge. And then um, when it comes time to vote and they and um, voters see names on a ballot, 
they they need the information about the candidates. What do the candidates stand for? And that's where the league's vote 411 information has become so essential. So what the the DC league did was they um, we had it printed. I dragged it down from the web, formatted it and had it printed. And this Charlie came and we mailed a thousand mailers on May the 6th before the primary um, to people in the Bureau of Prisons. So it was ever, it was designed to be your uh, match your ballot for the ward that you're registered in. So everybody got a different mailer. We almost half our mailers were ward seven, the ward seven candidates list. Um, so that so that was a challenge, and then um, and then I actually carried the printed material into the um, into the jail on the day of the election, which is not optimal timing, right? <laughs> you should have it ahead of time, and so that you know that's an opportunity for an improvement. But you know the the activity was the right activity; they just needed to get it sooner. And again, that was supposed to be on their tablets. And I think that um, Mr. Gaskin said the Ward 7 information was on the tablets, but not all of the candidates for all of the council seats who were running for, for the four wards that where there was an election. So, so um, we have the, the what's kind of defined. We know what the what is, but we haven't gotten it over to the implementation um, stage yet. Uh, that, the other thing, I, I mean, I thought, I think also just like in terms of research, you know, dispelling some of the myths, um, one, that these are people who are not interested. Mm -hmm. um, and number two, that, you know, <laughs> that they're not Republicans, because a lot of them are, I mean, like, there's a substantial, it's not going to be a majority. And there's no question that it's disproportionately people of color, blah, 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 but numerically it's not. Numerically it's more white people, for what it's worth. But the point, but, but <laughs> we have a lot of Republicans in our jails, believe me. So, um, you know, in terms of getting stuff passed, I think that's often a helpful talking point, which is kind of awful, but with the reality. Um, and uh, yeah, and so, and then humanizing, humanizing is so important for all of these things. Um, and and having people who have had these experiences at the front of whatever effort it is to make these things happen is just critical. Um, I just had a question about like um, how the information is delivered, like the um, educational portion. Like I um, know that a lot of people like within the prison system have like intellectual disabilities. So how is this accounted for and like the education that's given to them, especially in the tablets? That's a Myra question, right? I don't have a clear answer for that, Grace. The, um, the, the civics class was very simple and very fundamental. And we used a lot of um, pictures of elected representatives, pictures of buildings like the Wilson building. So, um, you know, compared to the, you know, the, the capital of the United States. So, um, but I don't know that we necessarily got to everybody with an intellectual disability. You know what, that's a really important point. And I, you know, you would know better than me if there's research on this, but, you know, obviously you're dealing with the population that probably disproportionately has low literacy rates. Um, and there's a lot of research on how to um, make that kind of material accessible you know, to people with lower, I don't know how they, you know, third grade, whatever reading skills. Um, I don't know if there are programs or efforts underway to get educational materials around these things to um, be designed for people with lower uh, civic, I mean, um, literacy. And we've, um, you know, there are videos available. We brought uh, the videos of the can candidate forums into the jail, but I don't, believe that the jail staff actually ever I mean you know a candidate form is a long it's a two-hour exercise and um 
so that you know lack of access to the internet lack of access to um local news um the disappearance of local news right um, all, all of that plays into the challenges of keeping people informed in general but especially in the jail right? correct yeah um I want to just also underscore for Grace, I, I want to send to you a, another report that I did a couple of years ago about different, uh, I worked with a, an organization called New Jersey Institute for Social Justice um, on how to sort of do meaningful, authentic outreach to returning citizens to participate that wasn't like, here's a registration form, the election's in two weeks, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and one of the really interesting things that I would another research uh, idea, but I would love to pursue further is that for a lot of the people who had been in prison and when they came out were the most kind of motivated, activated, um, were people who had read stuff in prison that had led them to become interested. Mm -hmm. And the uh, availability of having libraries and classes and stuff like that in the prison is like, you can't just you know, when the person's coming out and, you know, you're handing them a voter registration form, I mean, that's not, it's got to begin way before that, you know, from what I can understand and having libraries and classes and stuff like that available made a big difference. And New Jersey's really good about that. So I think that's also really important. And the impact of that is something that I would be really interested to know more, more about and how, what are the models for providing those kinds of um, resources to people before they get out, well before they get out. Well, we don't have a standard curriculum. <laughs> right, and you're working on it, right? Are you making yes. that happen? <laughs> yeah. But even, you know, it, it very, of course it varies tremendously, like where, where it's happening. I mean, DC, I can be hopeful about, New Jersey's great, but like in the other states, <laughs> Like they are, they are not going to have these books available. They're just not, you know, the way things stand right now and what you can do about that. Um, yeah, because that's another problem like we have in the office, like a, like certain facilities don't allow like us to send physical books in. So there's a lot of scanning and sometimes they'll be like, actually, we don't want this in our prison. So like they kind of like weasel through things a lot. And mm -hmm. I was shocked that the DC, like I didn't know about like the DC jail allowing like voting in because I, I know how restrictive they are in like any kind of um resources given to the incarcerated yeah. people. So I was so surprised. And so I'm really glad that's happening. Well, the candidate information has always been touchy, right? Like, cause they, they, you know, this happened in Denver in a big way that they didn't want candidate bios and stuff like that, that were being put together by the organizers. But that's why we <laughs> nailed it, Tova. We weren't asking. Oh, that. you guys are clever, man. Yeah. Well, but now in this law, and I can send you the exact language, but the law that they just passed requires them to be able, these organizations to be able to provide candidate information. And just really, because I talked to them a lot when this bill was being put together about, they needed to clarify because, you know, not the attorney general, the city, the city government was making decisions about, you know, what candidate information was and was not over the line or other kinds of information they wanted to provide was and and nobody had there were no standards for this no it was just up to this person and you know so we talked about that a lot and so that they do have in the law that you know these organizations have to be allowed to provide the candidate information i mean they were really they were providing the the bios that these people or no they were they were the answers to questions that the groups had posed to them and that they had written back and so they had written it themselves and they didn't want that coming in. But now I think that's been clarified really well, which I don't know if that's even something that, you know, you could get an amendment or something. I don't know. To the well, law. Well, it's the the D.C. jail was was cooperative this year, sort of, because they didn't prohibit my bringing it in. They just mm -hmm. didn't we didn't come to an agreement that I could until elect the election day. Yeah. Um, it's the Bureau of Prisons that has been so resistant, right. um, hiding behind the Hatch Act. Well, they, you have the federal situation there. Oh, which and, and, but that's why we mailed it. So, okay. <laughs> so that way we weren't asking for them to help us. 
Right. <laughs> And so they, I mean, and they allowed it in. That's really interesting. Well, I'll just say it this way. We're counting how much of the mail has been returned. Okay. We don't know. And and all, and the, so far, six, uh, 89 pieces have been returned out of almost a thousand pieces of mail. Um, yeah, I mean, this is unique to DC, you know, this piece of it. Right. Um, but I, I just, you know, I was struck that now that at least there's something in law because it being, you know, just sort of a, you know, a judgment call by somebody, whether something goes over the line into being, I don't know, not not, not nonpartisan or whatever is. Well, that would be helpful. <laughs> Angie, can you put yourself on mute, please? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, I, I I just want to say something about um, more conservative states, sort of red states that have got blue cities. Mm -hmm. That um, I think, and this is really to you, uh, Tova, uh, is I think one has to be incredibly careful about trying to expand voting in those blue cities because I think there's a very big chance that the state legislatures will prohibit the yeah. blue cities from doing so because that's yeah, the, the pattern in so many areas preemption. where sorry? Yeah, the, the preemption issue and home rule. Exactly. exactly. Fun I, I don't know if everyone would know what I meant by preemption. Yeah, no, no, no. So, yeah, I mean, I, and I mean, I from what I'm seeing that hasn't come up that much and I'm not really clear why because it hasn't even come up in Texas. So somebody needs to find out what's going there because they're doing, they've been doing it in Austin though. Maybe they're going to try and shut it down. I don't know. They've shut down everything else in Austin. Um, but they're doing it in Dallas and I haven't heard and I might not have because I don't know everything. Um, and then I know... There's a, um, an organization called Free Hearts in particular. They're doing some amazing work in Nashville, I know for a fact, um, where they're, they're, you know, they're incrementally at least, you know, get into this place. They're not, they're not going to have a polling place in the jail in some of these places, but they're really, you know, they're going to do things that are going to make voting much more accessible for people. Um, and, and they're making it a thing, you know, at least, you know what I mean? Um, I don't... I had not particularly thought about this until I talked to people, you know, I don't think it's something that enters people's minds. Um, and so then when you make people aware of it, you know, it, that makes a difference. Yeah. yeah. Charles. Yeah. You know, I, uh, I wanted to say, um, and you gave me the uh, perfect uh, uh, reason to say it. Uh, although I've been involved in criminal justice reform for over 50 years, the first, the first 15 years was in Texas. Oh, and, right. And we, uh, my wife and I, and, uh, uh, and the League of Women Voters worked on voting rights for people who had completed their sentence. And the argument we made, the biggest argument that when the system finishes with you, they ought to get off your back. And that really sold in Texas. Yeah. And eventually it, uh, it well, right now, we're one of the, the Texas is uh, one of the few states, the conservative states that has voting rights for people who complete their sentence. And we were able to pass that in the 70s. And so, uh, uh, it seems like there wasn't then the big fight there is between the Republicans and Democrats mm -hmm. and things. They just said, yeah, that sounds good. That sounds reasonable. So uh, it prepared me for coming up here. Uh, and of course, uh, what happened in D.C. was just beyond my dreams. I, I uh, you know, it's just incredible when you have an entire city council supporting voting rights for people incarcerated. And so it's been, a, I, I really was at the, one of the most conservative states or maybe the most conservative state in the union 
uh, and tried the voting rights and took, uh, it took quite a few years, but eventually it passed uh, as, you know, once they finished your sentence and then to come to DC, which was uh, most liberal in their stand. So I guess I'm, you know, anyway. Okay. No, there, there's totally hope. I mean, that that's, I think this is an area yeah. where there can be real hope. And I mean, I think it's it's part of the reason why getting out the success of DC is so important and also being able to explain that it's not, you know, or at least take away the argument on the jail side that this is, you know, that that they don't have capacity. I, I mean, I, t I, I get that that may be true in some cases, but in general, it's not an incredibly hard thing to pull off from what I can tell, not being actually a part of it, you guys know, but um, saying that it's going to cost a lot of money or drain a lot of time away, you know, and all that kind of stuff doesn't seem to be true in the places where it's being done. And if you can take, you know, that sort of, I don't know if it's a canard or I do believe it sometimes or if it's real, but, you know, being able to demonstrate I mean, regardless of DC's politics or Denver's politics, the implementation, the process is going to be fairly similar. So, um, and, you know, and I'm glad that I, I guess uh, Mr. Gaskins is, is going to be speaking a little bit. I think like Mr. Gaskins and, and you know, people in Denver too, like actually it's the people on the jail side that we it would be great to have out there more. Um, talking to their peers and colleagues. Um, and so if that's this, this is starting that ball rolling, I think that would be amazing too. I think mm. he's proud of his story. He should be. I was very moved talking to him, you know, quite honestly. And I don't know that they've always been this way or whatever, but I thought that they were really um, impressive. We're going to have some great um, pictures, too, of people voting and the uh, ANC, newly, newly elected ANC commissioner. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. From the jail, so. Because um, that clearly is a huge um, reason for high turnout in the D.C. jails. You know, mm -hmm. when one of their people is running for office that they're voting for, you know, and people are, I guess, campaigning in the jail. They are. You know, that's extraordinary. <laughs> and that that whole thing is completely unique to DC. I, I can't even convey what it is <laughs> to other places. I mean, other places don't really have ANC equivalents. So even no. just like sort of explaining that in the first place. But um yeah, it's really cool. I I enjoy telling people about what goes on in DC because people don't know. I have a I'm trying to, I'm looking for my picture. I have, I can share real quickly if I can get the, um, so I think you're looking at Shamika, Shamika Hayes, who was elected in January. Oh, uh, cool. Yeah, as the ANC commissioner for ANC 7FOH. I'll never forget that number. Um, and she's very articulate. She um, is very responsive and responsible. She has an, an internet accessible email account. Um, she goes, attends the meetings virtually. Um, so so Zoom did do, caused, yeah. gave us some capability. Um, so Shamika attends the meetings virtually. I told her that we wanted to tell her story when we go to Nashville to the American Corrections Association um, convening in August. And she said she would be happy, but she needed to approve what we said about her, <laughs> and <laughs> which that was great. I'm happy to do that. So she is serving her sent uh, her um, her as her her role as a commissioner. She they call her commissioner. Um, and, and so that was, I was at her swearing in and that was really emotional. It was very right. cool. It was a big celebration. Her mother cried. I cried. <laughs> so, okay. so that was cool. And uh, there's a couple, and that's, um, a poll worker and an election official, um, 
on election day. So that that was. I would love to get these too. I would love I, to put them up. Okay, I can. I, I we have. Uh, I'll let me talk to Mr. Gaskins. I, yeah, sure, all, sure. all these folks did sign waivers, um, but that's yeah. I mean, and convey to him how awesome I think it is that he's going to be speaking at this uh, conference, and and he should be taking the show on the road. You guys both, you know. <laughs> well, um, we'll think about that. Okay. <laughs> Any more questions for Tovith? Uh, we're so, so pleased to have you with us. And thank you guys for all the work you do. Honest well, it's, God. it's nice. It's great that you're shining the light back at us. And I, and the, and DC does have a lot to be proud of. Um, not to say that there isn't work to be done. There is work to be done, but we have a starting, we, we have a great platform on which to build. That's right. I was thinking of something really funny, like um, while you guys were talking about like um the how DC is more liberal and like how we're becoming more like progressive as a country, and I thought about it. I hope so. Like especially like um with the opportunity of a convicted felon might be able to win the presidency. <laughs> progress. So uh, it really yeah, yeah. Or it's, yeah. excellent point. I think like we're moving in the right direction. I guess I I hope so. It might maybe he'll maybe might. that that'll be the thing. He'll become the champion yes. now. Yes, of, we can. He needs to like start a new movement. <laughs> yeah, for real, something different. Let's not go yeah. there. Yeah, we got to stay off the topic. <laughs> yeah, me too. Okay, I'm gonna stop the recording. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I should have waited until you stopped the recording. I know, right? That's <laughs> okay, but I am gonna stop the recording just on general principles. Um,